This video is brought to you by Midway USA. Support the channel by choosing Midway for your shooting and outdoor supplies. What year is it? Oh, Josh, my friend. It is a year 2007. The surge has begun. Soldiers from across America are returning to service and to the global war on terror. And the United States Army has adopted the new digital age uniform to fall in line under General Shepard. Now let's go. One. 50. Impact. Impact. 200. Impact. Impact. 250. Impact. Impact. Was the it second push? shot was on the bottom left edge. Okay. All right. I've got to bump it a little bit then. Okay. All right, 300. Impact, left, left half. Give it a little bit more to the right. Off the left. Impact. Yeah, those are on the left half, huh? Yes. Okay. So the wind today is a pretty, it's a, it's a full value from right to left. And I'm seeing the flag it's almost at full mass. Yep. So typical fashion, we're shooting an AR and M4 platform, so the weather is going to be optimal suck. Oh yeah. <laughs> with massive wind. <laughs> All uh, right. I'm on at 350. Okay. That is an impact on the very left edge. Impact. Okay. I'm on at 400. Impact, dead center, send another. Impact, nice, nice dude. 450. Just low on the bottom edge. That's it. Nice, cleared. Okay. I'm on at 500. I believe that that sailed high over the top. Yep, well, there I it is, it. impact. As impact? Impact. Yep. Nice, dude, well done, well uh, done. Easy day, easy day. All right, a little bit of redemption here, eh? More than a little bit, I would yeah. say. I mean, so the last time we shot the M4, it was pretty warm. It was at the end of the day, I remembered, and uh, we were the was optic, like the high, the high heat of a Texas summer. Right. Um, the optic was also. Uh, this is an actual U.S. Marine RCO, so the actual issued optic for the M4. We are not shooting 62 grain ammunition, uh, but really, we could do a video on that later on. The difference between 62 and 55 is actually fairly minimal. Yeah, at this range, at these ranges. I mean, on top of that, M855 is actually less accurate yeah. than M M193, uh, but people on the internet would tell you otherwise. But this, the M4, uh, last time we didn't get to do a very good debrief on it. A uh, direct descendant of uh, a direct lineage from SOCOM's adoption from the XM4 
upgrading it to a flat top and cack rail and having that filter into the general populace of the United States military and nowadays being as synonymous to the military as the M1 Garand once was to the US military. And so it's got a special place in my heart because it is one of the rifles I not only fielded in the military, but also deployed with. Um, but I think there's a lot more that we should talk about. Uh, perhaps we could take it to a proper debrief unlike last time. Shall Sounds we? good, we'll see you all there. Well, hello there. You must have caught us at the Battalion Field Headquarters as we were about to break for lunch. Now we're trying to not have the MREs. I hear the boys in the field are quite fond of them. I hope you're enjoying the show thus far. Shows like this, they're brought to you by Slate Black Industries. And more importantly, we have the support from the patrons of Patreon and Utreon. Now that's true. This group of men and women, they support us intellectually, financially, but most importantly, emotionally. So today, I'd like to invite you, come, join us, become one of us. Together, we could plan to conquer the world of firearms technology. But if you cannot, that's all right. We completely understand. We'd be just as happy to hear from you in the comments section below. Well, without further ado, we'll leave you back to it. Welcome back into the debrief. The power of the ACU is strong, Henry. It's strong. <laughs> Man, I was just a patrol cap short of looking like, well, actually, I would have been wearing an ACH, a helmet, if I were actually qualifying in the military with the M4, right? Those two misses directly driven by your lack of the ACH. Yep, yep, of course. And a PT belt. <laughs> <laughs> so look, this was one of our original runs. The, the M4A1 Block 1 Riz Rail, 14 and a half inch gun Riz Rail ACOG that we posted right when we started the show. And I know that it's one that since that point in time, as we have developed, we've gotten a better system for recording. We have improved as shooter spotter. Um, we have wanted to rerun on this course and give it some redemption. Because in spite of the fact that at the time in which we filmed the previous run, again, at the very onset of this project, we thought that it was, you know, did sufficiently well. That was also the same period of time where we sort of expected to have four, six, eight misses per run as a standard. And that has simply not been how things have progressed as, again, for a number of factors, which we'll cover off in this debrief, uh, we have adjusted and improved over time. But before we get to that, I know you wanted to walk through some of the history on this particular platform and give it the true debrief that we were never able to do previously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the M4A1, I think, has accom accompanied a lot of the service members of our current era and through the global war on terror era. Uh, for the Marines, they would have been using the A4. Um, and, you know, with sprinkles of M4 carbines in it. But for a vast majority of the army, uh, if you served during the GWAT era and post-GWAT era, you would have been with an M4. Now, typically, the ACOG is, um, you'll see people in a leadership role with an ACOG. It's one of those side things it's like a, it's like a handgun you know it's like the pistol the m9 you know, typically you see leadership roles have a, a handgun and um in the army mind is because then your leadership has a magnified optic to see the target the see an objective a little better 
and, and gaining more re intel for the leadership to, to make decisions on on objective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot more to this on the story, the journey the M4 took in becoming the main weapon system, the M1 Garand of our era, right? Mm. Um, and I think a lot of that actually like predates a lot of this well before even into the Vietnam era and, and the the deployment of the shorter carbine as the XM-177 and how that translated into later service. But I think we should start this story sort of in the, uh, the 80s and the 90s um, with our military special operations unit, Naval Special Warfare, and the Army's uh, Green Beret, specifically Delta, um, and their use of the M16A2 carbine. Uh, the M16A2 carbine, of course, is a 14.5 inch barreled M16 carbine. Uh, some of them with a grenade cut, some of them without grenade cut, could have a skinny barrel, could have a, you know, what we know nowadays as an M4 profile barrel. Uh, but that ended up being the champion for SOCOM's use back in the day because they realized that that 14 and a half inch barrel uh, and the collapsible stock, while it was um, short enough for a lot of maneuvering, and I will say that even though it doesn't have a folding stock, it is still, because the receiver section is shorter than a lot of other weapon systems, let's say the AK, it still is fairly compact, even though it couldn't fold. And so uh, this, the 14, the big problem they had before that was that the 10.5s, the 11 inch barrels, you just couldn't get the same reliability in, in different temperature zones. Uh, you're looking at the XM-177s needing to put a moderator at the very end just to add reliability initially. Like I know how what they say, yes, it does change the 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 carbines reports it does it's allegedly sounds closest to in uh, kalashnikov you don't that's not a main point of this you, you develop weapon systems mainly for devices to drive their reliability and their effectiveness in the field primarily before you have some crazy idea of changing the weapons report so the XM-177 and its muzzle device was primarily designed and, and deployed with effectiveness, which they, they found later on in the 80s and the 90s that the 14 5-inch barrel actually was a really good balance between the ballistic effectiveness of the system and the performance in different weather conditions, like extreme cold or extreme heat. You still had enough dwell time for the weapon system to operate. And then on top of that, it still gave it enough velocity because the 556 five, relies on velocity for for um for its wounding and killing uh the 556 five, cartridge still retained enough velocity to be effective in the field uh with a 145 barrel and so as we roll in we're watching these movies about you know delta in black hawk down and and they're rolling around in with 145 carbines that was a significant development a significant adaptation for these specialized units to use because of course as they go through as the seals also use a lot of m4s through the 90s and the early 2000s big army um dod started to look at hey these things are actually fairly effective in the field and they started to pivot and initially ordering a lot of the uh shorter systems as um a, a main arm for the um for reserve troops, or, or not reserve troops, but um, rear echelon troops, as warfare became a lot more blurred between the front and the rear lines, um, and as as we became increasingly mechanized, having a more nimble and um, versatile firearm, uh, main, main rifle, uh, became more important than the terminal velocity and the, the, the overall you know, engagement distance, because then we started seeing SOCOM take another step in adding rail systems to add accessories to the rifle itself. I mean, first it came to taking the XM4, which is the carry handle version, um, and shaving that carry handle off and putting Picatinny rails on it, and that turned into the M4 carbine. 
But then on top of that, um, adopting the Knight's Riz rail system uh, enabled the enabled SOCOM to use a lot of uh, force multipliers, uh, like lights, lasers, bipods, vertical grips, um, your optics, of course, with the with the flat top. And we take a lot of that for granted nowadays in the world of, <laughs> you know, uh, a 399 Palmetto State kit and you get all that capability in it. But if you rewind to 2001, and even if you watch uh, Jeff Gerwich's channel, um, he went through the process of adopting the M4 into his Green Beret teams. That was a capability that did not previously exist. And of course, you remember Brad over at the M16A2 episode that we ran earlier. They specifically had to make a mounting system that clamped onto the barrel that stuck up through the handguard to put the uh, the PEC unit on top of the M16A2 uh, rifles. And that's not even that's not even to include how you mounted lights, because of course in Black Hawk Down, you remember they were using um, the Surefire barrel clamp mounts mm -hmm. and duct tape to tape the, uh, the, uh, the pressure switches onto, onto the rail. Uh, does it work? Yes, it does. But um, is it... <laughs> Is it as clean of a solution? Is it as easy to use? Is that is, is it nearly as easy to uh, switch things around for you know what the operator or what the soldier or marine needs in the field? Absolutely not. Um, and especially, I mean, we didn't test it here, but the RIS system, I really liked it because it still accommodated the use of an M203, an underslung M203 underneath. So that continues to feed more towards that modularity concept of taking a lighter weight rifle, more nimble, has less weight to begin with, and then it back you can backfeed some of that weight to gain more capability on the other end. So the process of the adoption of the uh, the M the XM4 through the M4 through the M4A1 through the M4 Block One was really interesting. How SOCOM really experimented with a lot of different methods of adding capability to a soldier uh, when they were out in the field and how big army saw that and pulled it into main service and how now we see this as a main uh, a main weapon to uh, all the service members out there. Now, the thing that strikes me most interesting is how in the last, in the recent days, we've sort of stepped away from that and somehow step towards the XM5 where they just adopted something without uh, without really having sort of SOCOM and special operations forces feel it out. So I'm not going to say whether I agree or disagree with that, but I think it's interesting. And so following that history, let's carry that through then to this actual run here on the course. What rifle were we actually shooting here? So this is a Colt 6921. Um, and this was, I believe, so the, the upper is a Dimaco upper. So it's actually a Canadian built upper or Canadian parts upper of uh, Colt Canada parts upper, which is some of the highest quality um, Colt AR-15 parts you can, you can get of that era. Um, and the entire Colt 6920-6921 line um, was the same line as the military manufacturing line for the M4, except, of course, it's in the semi-auto form. So um, the rail itself is a full Knight's RAS, so it's a later employment, not the early wrist rail. It's a later RAS rail. Same thing for all intents and purposes. Uh, and then we're using a Marine Corps retired uh, RCO, so uh, a TA-31 ACOG that's a little bit salty. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's that's basically it. This is as close to a civilian ownership of a military M4 from the golden age of the GWAT era. <laughs> right. And the ammunition that we were shooting here, although tagged as 223 ammo in our opinion based on what we've what we what we have seen and tested is actually much closer to a full-on 
M193 556 load. Correct. Right. Yeah, it's it's a 556 velocity load. I think they did that because they they didn't seal it uh because your M855 is supposed to be sealed for, you know, weather reasons, but if they were manu I, I don't know this for sure, but you know, I I just know that it performs close to a 556 load. It's not M855, but technically M855 is less accurate than M193 because of the steel core inside. I would say that's neither here nor there. I mean, the accuracy difference would not yield too different of a result, in my opinion, from what we saw here. Mm -hmm. Right. So then let's start to draw some comparatives here, Henry. You just shot the course with the, uh, this, the this particular Colt setup with two misses. One at 300 for windage. And one at 450 for elevation, both very close. They were near misses. Uh, and you tagged one extra impact because we were unsure based off of how the target responded at 500. But you shot the course with two misses. That's in the line with some of the absolute best runs we've had on the course, including... Uh, rifle shooting 77s and with magnified optics uh, or full LPVOs rather uh, as opposed to just the ACOG which you know that debate is neither here nor there at the moment but uh, theoretically more magnification should yield a potentially better result and that's you know this is still right up there with the absolute best performers on the course and when we compare that to where we were when we published a very original M4, uh, or I believe it was the FN 15 plus ACOG video from years ago. One, of course, which has now become one of the most watched videos on the show. You scored a 29, was it, out of yep. 40 versus an 18 out of 40. So a, a massive difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we let, let's talk through that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I... I know we try to keep things in a glass vacuum as much as possible by saying same shooter, you know, same weapon system, similar course, etc. But I've gotten better. <laughs> I've gotten better at shooting these things, especially back then. Um, I was actually never qualified. I never qualified with an M4 using an ACOG. So my time on the ACOG was actually fairly limited especially compared to now like i nowadays you and i josh you and i shoot acogs all the time and it's a couple of things that time we were uh also i mean there's okay let's let's reel it back i think i got better i think we've gotten better working as a team i mm -hmm. also think during that day when we were shooting it for the initial time frame it was so hot because it was like one or two in the afternoon in august in texas after we'd been working since nine in the morning and we're just at that point we we're spent uh mm -hmm. so i think multiple things added to that type of a, of a performance i think for an average soldier that would have been a, an acceptable performance because really the misses for that particular run started after 300 i think i had one at 300 but mm -hmm. after 300 when it started which that would coincide with what the army's observations for a regular soldier would be with an M4 and an ACOG within that 550 meter max effective range pocket and then qualifying mm -hmm. at 300 meters. Like, Especially given the size of the targets as well, yeah. right? Shooting yeah. sub, sub torso, much smaller targets than what would be a standard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, you know, this is this is not this is sort of a redemption run. This is not in any ways trying to, you know, rewrite history or whatever. It's just I think multiple things feed towards this. Like the weapon system we're using, yes, is closer to a duplicate of what the military is currently using. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that is just a small fraction of what yes. we're talking about when it comes to the grand scheme of things like and that that's key henry because the number of let's just say the number of response or, or the commentary about you were shooting in the original video we shot actual uh fioki 223 ball ammunition as opposed to 556 or or 556 velocity ammunition 
And the resounding commentary was, well, this is because you didn't shoot 5.56 velocity ammunition. Things didn't line up with your ACOG correctly, for example. <sighs> but what we know in actuality is, while that there's some truth to, the, to that, it's just not the material factor which which would have or wouldn't have made this substantial of a difference on the run. I, I will say uh, back then, and this is not to detract from what you said, but back then we did not true our optics like we do nowadays. Um, and while that would have helped a little bit, it still wouldn't entirely help because the velocity curve is different between the 55 grain 223 Fiocchi versus the GGG, which is a, an, a, an XM193 spec ammunition uh, to begin with. Um, but I am confident if I took this same rifle out with a 30-round magazine of Wolf steel case, <laughs> I would yeah. smoke that range as opposed to what I did before. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I, that, I agree completely. Yeah. That's and that's exactly the point that I was I was trying to draw here. You you summed it up, practically speaking, exceptionally well. It's just even from uh, it, from my own perspective on it. At that time, like the equipment we were using to to vi to to try to spot and capture video, we've dramatically improved. Uh, the spotting equipment that, that I use dramatically improved. M my skill being able to see where the rounds are going dramatically has changed and improved. And I, I, the, com the combination of all of these, these things combined, again, result in a material improvement. And so as we continue down this avenue of, again, redemptions or looking back on runs that we had shot previously... You have to keep in mind that this just emphasizes the value of actual training with the system and not just training with it every once in a while, but the constant reoccurring knowledge that you are gaining and building upon and improving going out day after day after day shooting various systems or the same system over and over and over and the amount of you know, total information that you're able to gain, gather, and improve upon what you knew the day before. Yeah, so so the, oh my gosh, like that, for the audience out there, the, the previous video with the FN15 was initially labeled M4A1 uh, with ACOG. And, and that, honestly, I just, it egged at me so much because I, I ended up going back and changing the thumb, changing the title because I didn't want that to reflect the M4A1 because I knew that it had more potential there. But I also knew that a part of that potential was me on how I was using it. That, now, by no means is it, is it ineffective during that, during that shooting, uh, during that, that string. Like for a regular soldier, that's actually still very effective. But the amount of time that we've had on the weapon system absolutely also makes a difference. But... I want to sort of use this to draw back to what people do in the military um, when it comes to the weapon system itself. With uh, some units in the army, let's say if you are, I don't know, I don't know, if, if you are a guard, uh, if you're a reserve unit, maybe, uh, maybe not less so, because a guard and reserve, they end up with a bunch of guys who actually shoot their own clone rifles on the side and get really good at mm. that stuff. But rather, you end up with some active duty guys. Uh, who are in units that only qualify twice a year, and they go out, exactly. and they, their familiarization course is to shoot at the 25-meter target in a prone position to make sure that they all get into that 25-meter zero range. And that's it. They send you off the course, and they tell you, all right, you know, God bless you, son. Go forth and accomplish things. And, you know, if you don't, if you only get marksman, then so be it. It still goes on your record. That that's just that's not a great force building technique and as much as we as much as i crap on the the marines like with with a with a kind heart i, I mean you know it's just ragging on them for fun the marines they spend a whole week on the range before they qualify and that type of that type of focus is why they yield better shooters in some units then you know in in as a whole when mm -hmm. when you take you know just a sample size and saying i'm going to take a marine doesn't matter what marine 
your chances of that marine shooting better is slightly higher because they spend more time on the range. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that being said, spending one week out of the whole year on the range for familiarization still isn't going to turn you into a marksman exceptionnel. Um, <laughs> but it certainly is better than what the army does. Twice a year, you take someone, you give them 40 rounds to shoot at a 25 meter zero target. Again, this is not for everyone in the army, but you know, some units, let's say like if you're in a logistics unit, if you're in a medical unit that doesn't have the same emphasis on weapons training or weapon use, you end up with that, which, you know, uh, that I think that's where it comes down to, you know, if if this is something that if weapons handling, weapons training, proficiency of using your main weapon system is important to you, training and using it is absolutely one of the most paramount things, especially if it comes down to something that could save your life in the long run, um, if you're in a deployed environment. And, and, and to that effect, because I didn't true it or I didn't spend more time figuring out the ACOG, I feel like that generated the result that we saw of a 29 out of 40 um, uh, results in the first run. Something that yeah, I've I mean, it definitely could have been a factor, right? Definitely could yeah. have been a factor or, or a significant factor. But I do think it was a totality of numerous things which resulted in, in that result, many of which were remedied by experience gained over the last four years. Mm -hmm. And so with that said, guys, let us know in the comments below. What rifles you'd like to see us do uh, redemption runs on? And if they're still sitting around in inventory, perhaps, perhaps we'll add them to the list to take back out. Of course, we appreciate all of the support from those who follow us and subscribe on Utreon and Patreon. Of course, we're also available on Rumble. And if you enjoy listening to Henry and I talk... Be sure to go over and check out the 9H Podcast YouTube show, where uh, Henry predominantly leads uh, some very interesting discussions <laughs> with, uh, with people around the world. Henry, anything else to add? No, oh, man. Just happy to give this thing uh, really a, a, a much more better representing run to what its capabilities are, because I am tired of seeing people rag on the M4 on all of the AK videos. I'm tired, sick and tired of it. So. You heard it here. No more ragging on the M4. Well, you can you can try to rag. I'm just going to copy this link and post it onto the the comment that you write about the M4 <laughs> sucking more than the AK. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, gang. With that, until next time, we'll see you on the range. Seven one six is Bill Knight six four Vic eight packs Redcon one green to green top copy over. Bill Knight six this is seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight one one pack.